without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ed Kroc, and he's with um, the University of British Columbia. And today he's going to be speaking on um, power analysis uh, in network meta-analysis. Well, thanks for being here. Um, so as Pearl said, I'm at uh, the University of British Columbia, so I'm an assistant professor there um, in the MERM program, Measurement Evaluation and Research Methodology. Um, been there a couple years now. So um, I, do, uh, I, I do a lot of various miscellaneous statistics, um, intersecting sometimes with the, the domain of meta-analysis, and uh, um, had the opportunity in the past to work with Carol on some of these things. So um, lots of interesting issues. Um, and she asked me to put together some, a little bit of a talk on power issues, uh, issues related to uh, statistical power, notions of statistical power, um, in the context of meta-analysis, um, broadly construed, that's at least the perspective I'm going to take today. Um, but so hopefully you guys can uh, um, get something useful out of this um, uh, that will even apply outside of the uh, direct context of a meta-analysis per se. Um, but the, the general structure of what I'm going to really talk about today is I, I'm, I'm going to spend a decent amount of time kind of reviewing what statistical power means. Um, and the, uh, the implications um, of various types of statistical power for our interpretation and our assessment of uh, studies, and quality studies. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about what are called typically type S and type M errors. Sometimes these are called type 3 and type 4 errors as well, um, which some of you may have encountered before. Um, but these types of, um, these types of errors are in addition to kind of the classic um, false positive, false negative, type one, type two errors we're used to. Um, and I think they become pretty important, at least particularly this type M error, um, becomes pretty important uh, in the context of meta-analysis in particular. So I want to spend some time kind of uh, talking about that and um, showing types of effects that this can have um, regarded to power issues for meta-analysis. And then I'm going to kind of talk through the basically the main the main settings of meta analysis, the very simple fixed effects type model, random effects type model, and then a more general mixed effects type model. So this this includes what we would commonly refer to as meta regression or you get into more complicated things like network meta analysis. Um, network meta analysis is some kind of mixed effects model, um, using kind of the the um, general statistical language. Um, so this is ultimately where we want to go. We want to be able to understand, okay, what are the unique power issues um, uh, related to these types of kind of more sophisticated meta-analyses. Um, that's kind of structure as we go. Um, and I think as Carol said before, if, if you do have questions, if things occur to you as um, I'm going through the slides here, um, I think you can just write them in the chat and um, we can get to those questions later or maybe if uh, you know, Carol will be monitoring them. So um, if there's anything super urgent, she can just jump in and let me know um, and we can get those answers. Okay, great. So um, statistical power. So we kind of all know that this is kind of an important issue that we should care about if we want to design a quality study, but also if we want to actually um, uh, reasonably interpret a study that's already been done. Um, and we always hear kind of this, this, this common uh, uh, bromide um, in the literature that, well, meta-analyses can be really attractive because they are kind of a nice way to increase statistical power, uh, increase our power to find uh, effects of interest. So, so this, is a, this is a very oversimplified statement, as, as we'll see as we go through this process. Um, but it's, it's based off of this, this intuition that we kind of are all uh, equipped with when we first start uh, when we first start learning kind of our baby stat stuff. Um, this idea that well, okay, power power is good because it allows us to uh, have a good chance of detecting non-zero effects in a population if they're really there. So that's good. We don't want to waste our time um, design a whole study and sink a bunch of costs. Um, and then have a really low chance of actually being able to find what we're looking for. So high power is a good thing. And we learned this relationship very early on that if you increase your sample size, kind of keeping all else the same, um, that's going to directly translate into higher power. So this, this certainly informs this 
intuition that, well, meta-analyses are kind of a nice way, uh, should be kind of a nice way to um, increase our statistical power, uh, to find or estimate effects of interest. Um, and we'll see that, in fact, that that does hold in a very simple uh, case, like the fixed effects um, meta-analytic model, the most basic kind of meta-analysis you do. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily have to hold um, in more complex settings and for more uh, for more realistic, what I would call more realistic meta-analyses. Um, they don't necessarily need to be more powerful than um, their constituent studies. So we'll, we'll see why and talk about that. Um, so just uh, to give you some some definitions in case maybe you're uh, you're not uh, quite as familiar with looking at these things on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I think that this is a this informal definition of power here um, is is a nice way to think about it, uh, at least heuristically. So our ability to detect non-zero effects that are in the population from actual non-zero treatment effects. More formally, you can define it in terms of a probability statement. Um, and so a power is often talked about as a percentage or a probability, 80% um, power or something like that. Um, this is, of course, also referred to as sensitivity um, in a lot of the medical, medical literature. Um, and we kind of often have this figure cited at us that, well, good studies kind of strive to have power of at least 80%. Um, in fact, though, and a lot of work has been done on this in a variety of fields by very, very smart people, we actually kind of know now that uh, actually a lot of our published studies, um, yeah, pretty much in, no matter what domain you're in, um, a lot of our published studies actually end up having lower power than kind of this, uh, this threshold that we strive for. And in fact, a lot of times much, much lower power than that. And this can have serious consequences for us when we're going back into the literature and trying to assess what we actually know, what we've actually learned. And so in the context of meta-analysis, when we're actually trying to do that in a more formal way, trying to synthesize these um, results that we kind of have from the previous literature, um, if we have a bunch of these, these previous results that are based on low power settings, low power studies, this can have kind of a cascading effect um, through our actual formal meta-analysis uh, and potentially compromise our conclusions. Of course, that's something we'd like to try to avoid. Um, so these kind of like truth table things, this is kind of what I always have in mind, and I, I think they're, they're useful to think about. So um, power is always talking about these, these, these green cells right here. So you can kind of imagine that in the context of traditional hypothesis testing, um, we have kind of we're in one of two counterfactual realities. So either we're studying some phenomena where there actually is um, a zero effect. There's no, say, differential effect of treatment um, or between groups, between placebo and treatment, say. So maybe we are in the universe where that null hypothesis is true, no effect. Um, or we're in a universe where, OK, there is actually a non-zero effect. There's something, some difference uh, between our groups between our treatments, say. So in one of these two realities, um, we can, of course, make one of two decisions. We can, so this is just some kind of a standard one study type um, situation, collect some data, maybe calculate a test statistic, like a, a, a T statistic or something, to check if the, the average response in your two treatment groups uh, is the same. Um, so we can collect data and conclude that these data are either inconsistent or consistent with, say, our null hypothesis. So we make one of these two decisions, and we have to be in one of these two realities. So that gives rise to these four possible um, results we can find ourselves in. So two kinds of correct decisions we can make, two kinds of incorrect decisions we can make. And power specifically refers to this particular type of correct decision up here, this true positive. So when H0 is false, that means when we're in the reality that there is actually some difference in the treatment groups, say, some actual non-zero difference to detect, um, in that reality, we actually uh, find evidence for that. So we actually make the correct decision once we've collected our data, computed our test statistics, say, um, we make the correct decision and say, yes, we, you might say, we reject the null hypothesis. Um, so power actually is the probability of making this correct decision. So if I have this 
separate table down here that looks almost the same, except I've got this little probability notation here. So technically, power is the chance that you make a uh, correct decision, a true positive decision. And this is typically denoted by this 1 minus beta notation. Um, but this is what we're referring to when we talk about power. And this is our focus for, for this entire time here. Now, this picture is really what I always recommend people um, keep in mind when they're trying to think about power. This, this, is, this is really kind of the most um, uh, descriptive illustration of what statistical power means and how it interacts with all these other things like type 1 error, type 2 error in kind of our classic uh, hypothesis testing framework. So took a minute or two here to kind of just explain what all these things mean. Um, so similar to that previous slide, we know that we are in one of two realities, counterfactual realities, either a reality where this null hypothesis is true, so say there's no difference between the treatment groups on average, that corresponds to this red curve here, or we are in a reality where there is actually a difference. And maybe we don't know a priori what that actual treatment effect is, but it's something different from zero. Notice this, this curve under the null hypothesis is actually centered at zero. It's centered around this um, uh, point effect of zero. So what these curves are actually representing, these are actually representing the sampling distribution of your test statistic. So again, if you kind of, I think it's always useful to just go back to a very simple case. So think of a t-test um, or a test for zero correlation or something, say. Um, but if you think of this as a t-test between two groups, um, this red curve here is literally the sampling distribution of that t-statistic, uh, assuming that there's no actual population difference in the averages between the groups. This black curve is the actual uh, true distribution of that sampling of that sampling statistic. Here, we don't know exactly what the average difference is between groups. If we knew what the average difference was, we wouldn't need to actually collect any data because we would know what we're studying. Um, but uh, the black curve is unknown to us in general. The red curve is kind of what we assume. And so this is how we perform hypothesis testing. We say, OK, well, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, assuming we're actually on this red curve, um, we're going to calculate some test statistic. And if it happens to be extreme, so kind of fall in the tails of this red distribution, and that's where this um, dark green shading is, if our test statistic happens to be extreme, assuming this red null distribution is true, well, then we're going to say that this gives evidence against the null distribution. This gives evidence that, in reality, actually, our curve should be something like this black one. It should be shifted over in some direction or another. So this, um, this kind of defining region for what makes a test statistic extreme, this is governed by our type 1 error rate, which is typically 5%. For this talk, I will just assume without uh, even uh, mentioning it that it's going to always be fixed at 5%. Of course, you can fix this to whatever you want in practice. Um, but this is kind of what determines our threshold for what we're going to consider uh, an extreme value under the null hypothesis. Um, so that's this graphically given by these dark green shaded regions of the null. And then I have this kind of lime green shaded region, and I'm calling this power. Um, so notice this lime green shaded region, so it's related to this threshold set by the type 1 error rate. And it's also mapping out an area that's related to the true distribution of the sampling statistic. Right? So this black sampling distribution, this is the true unknown distribution of our test statistic. And so what you can see here is, well, all right, if so this black curve, remember, corresponds to reality. It's centered at the unknown true value uh, representing, say, the average difference between our groups. We don't, we don't know that we're actually in this black distribution a priori, but we're certainly collecting data, and our data are actually going to be coming from, they're going to be reflecting the shape of this black distribution. So you can kind of see that, all right, if we find data that is inconsistent with the null, happens to, course, happens to fall into this dark green region, the kind of extremes, the tails, 
of that null distribution, then that's the same thing as falling in this lime shaded region uh, for the true distribution. Now, there would actually be a little bit of lime down here in the left, but it's just so tiny you can't really see it. Um, here, you can actually see, all right, if I'm in the extreme of this null distribution, then I have to be in this lime shaded region here of the true sampling distribution. And this literally corresponds to the power. So this is saying, all right, I'm trying, go back to that previous slide here, remember the power corresponds to this particular type of correct decision, a true positive. So when there um, is a non-zero effect in the population, what is the probability that I conclude that the data are inconsistent with the null, right? So I'm assuming that the null is false. That's exactly this black distribution here. And then I'm also properly concluding that my data are inconsistent with the null. So that exactly corresponds to this little lime green region here. And for this particular um, diagram that I've shown here, uh, the, uh, the area under this region this corresponds to about 25% probability, which is not very high, power of about 25%. Um, this, you can kind of take this general feature though and translate it to any type of data setting that you want. So I just have here, I'll just kind of quickly go through these, but I have here some other um, illustrations of, <coughs> excuse me, some other illustrations of uh, study scenarios that you can find yourself in. So this one corresponds to very, very low power, power of only 8%. And what you can see here is there's actually the difference between this null effect, so zero difference between the groups, and the true effect, here I've switched to blue rather than black, sorry. Um, this actual difference between the null effect and the true effect in the population, it looks pretty small. It's a pretty small true effect size. Um, and maybe this corresponds to a small sample size or a large variance as well. The sample size and variance, that of course um, governs the tightness of these distributions. Here, though, if you just kind of focus on, again, that rejection region, so again, you kind of think, if I'm at the tails of the null distribution, that means I'm going to be rejecting the null hypothesis, and that's a good thing here because there is actually a non-zero difference in the population. Well, unfortunately here, that lime green area, uh, it's not very big. So if I'm in the tail of the null distribution, I kind of automatically have to be in the tail of the true sampling distribution. So that means it's pretty unlikely. It's hard to get in the tail of these null distributions. We're much more likely to find ourselves somewhere in the middle. So this is this corresponds to a very, very low power, a very low chance of being able to actually find evidence for this non-zero treatment effect. If I move to a situation like this, this is something where we would actually we actually would strive for in say our study designs. Here I have very, very high power. You can see it's almost 100 percent actually. And notice that there's very, very nice separation between these two counterfactual realities. Right? So again, this red curve, this is assuming the null centered on zero. And this blue curve here is reality, what I'm actually trying to study. So here there's actually, say, a large true effect size. So I've got some arbitrary scale here, but um, got an actual effect size here at about five units. And you can see that there's really nice separation between these two curves. And so again, if you play that same game and think, all right, well, assuming the null, I am going to have evidence against it if I fall into the tails of that null distribution. And again, you can kind of see that corresponds to these little um, regions outlined by these black thresholds. Um, notice that this true, the, the, the true sampling distribution curve, it falls almost entirely in the extreme of the null distribution, right? Almost this entire blue curve is almost completely above this kind of 0.05 threshold. So that's really, really good. That means that our power is really high. We're going to have a great chance of actually, uh, uh, of our sample data actually providing strong evidence against this null hypothesis. This is kind of the situation we're always striving to, uh, to be in. Um, but Fortunately, that's kind of idealized. Uh, we might find ourselves in something more like this. So again, small amount of power. Here I have a very, very small true effect size. And you can see here something just to, I've had it on the slides. I haven't emphasized it yet, but 
small and large are relative terms when we're talking about power in particular, just because power depends on so many different things. So it's, yes, it is about how big the actual effect size is in the population. So here I have a very, very tiny effect size. It's only the true effect size is about 0.05, very, very small. Um, but I know that I can make the shapes of these sampling, sampling distributions. I can make them smaller, tighter, um, by, say, increasing my sample size. Um, you can increase your sample size and increase your power, but if you changed your target of study to be studying something with a very, very small true effect, uh, your sample size might not be sufficient. It's not necessarily guaranteed to increase power if you're kind of changing your target of study. That's pretty important to us in a meta-analytic context, um, especially in the context of something like a, uh, a network meta-analysis, say, where we're actually trying to kind of synthesize um, a variety of different effect sizes, uh, usually all related somehow, um, but trying to synthesize um, a variety of different uh, kind of population effects. Um, it's in this type of situation, or from these types of diagrams, we can kind of see that, well, what might be kind of sufficient sample size for one of these targets of interest doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily going to translate to sufficient sample size for another target of interest. And that could be a reflection of the fact that, well, maybe the different effects we're trying to synthesize, they correspond to very different sizes of effects in that population. Um, so we could, we could find ourselves in a situation where we're actually having to, I don't know, maybe we're synthesizing effects where we have very, very nice separation between the null and uh, reality, and at the same time trying to synthesize related but different effects where we have very, very poor separation between the null and reality. So this can lead to, to uh, real challenges um, when we're trying to make some kind of global power statements about our ability to, uh, to fit these models to, um, to synthesize these effects. Um, oh yeah, this is kind of a silly example where we have actually like essentially perfect power and you, this would be great, you wouldn't even need to perform a test of hypothesis. Of course, we're rarely in this situation, unfortunately. Um, okay, so um, that, that's kind of base power and intimately related to this, just want to say a little bit about these two other types of errors that you can commonly make. So these have been known for, for decades, going at least back to Tukey, but there's a very nice paper by Gelman, Carlin, Gelman and Carlin in 2014 um, that uh, talk a, little about, a lot about and illustrate these types of errors called type S for sign and type M for magnitude errors. Um, and these are errors that become a big concern when we find ourselves in situations where we have uh, low power. So this could be in a situation where maybe you're synthesizing a variety of studies that have low power themselves, um, or perhaps you're doing some type of uh, meta-analysis, some type of synthesis where your target effects um, are known to be pretty small. Um, so these issues can become really, really large. And so it turns out you can actually mathematically show that in these types of scenarios, in these types of settings, um, the effect estimates you find from any of your constituent studies uh, they're going to be overinflated, sometimes actually massively overinflated. And I'll kind of show you a picture of that. Um, the sign error um, is, is less concerning in practice, um, but there is the possibility that your actual effect estimates from your constituent studies could be in the wrong direction as well. Um, this, this can be a big problem, particularly for meta-analysis, particularly because we know we have quite a bit of evidence that you know, statistically significant results are more likely to be published uh, than non-statistically significant results, um, and they tend to be published at a greater rate. And these two types of errors, they, they are uh, directly related to estimates um, that are statistically significant. So if you have a low-powered study, you can, of course, still find a statistically significant uh, result. You might not have a good chance of it, um, but if we have 20 labs studying this, uh, this phenomenon all with low power, then we might expect just a few of those labs to find statistically significant results just by chance. Um, and how we know how publishing works, it's probably those few labs that are going to get their results published and not the 18 or 19 of the 20 labs um, that end up finding no significant results at all. So this, this type M error in particular can become uh, very, very concerning in this type of setting. 
And if you go back and look at this kind of picture we have, this type of pot, so this is a low power setting here, a power of 8%, um, you can see, well, all right, my, the true effect size here, it's pretty small, at least compared to the sampling variance uh, of this, uh, this test specific. So uh, I don't know what it looks like here, maybe about one or one and a half on the scale that I have. And again, I've kind of highlighted in lime green the region that corresponds to our power, our ability to detect evidence for this non-zero uh, treatment effect. And what you can see is, okay, well, so if I have a study in this situation, this low-powered situation, where I actually find a statistically significant result, what does that mean? That means that in order to achieve statistical significance, my test statistic uh, had to fall into the extreme tails of this red distribution. I remember this red distribution is the distribution of the test statistic assuming no difference, assuming the null. So if I found statistical significance, I had to have been in this lime green region. Now, what I really want you to look at here is the true effect that this, we're trying to estimate, say with our t-test, whatever it might be, the true effect we're trying to estimate, that actually corresponds to this, this the center of this black distribution right here, right? This true effect size, it's something small, something like one or 1 1.5 on the scale. But if I'm, if I'm if my estimate is statistically significant, means I have to be in this lime region, notice just how far away this lime green region is from the true effect size. This is exactly what we call a magnitude error, a type M error. And in this particular situation, if you have a power of about 8%, it turns out that if your estimate falls in this lime green region, so if it is statistically significant, then it's guaranteed, this is not a probabilistic statement, it is guaranteed that it has to be at least eight times bigger than the true effect size it's actually trying to estimate. Right? The difference between this true effect size of about one and this lime green region, well, it's about eight times different, eight times the difference. So this can be a huge error that we're making um, in a low power setting. And you can imagine if we then translate that to a meta-analytic setting where maybe we have several um, low power studies that we're trying to synthesize, um, each of those low power studies will be making some type of magnitude error like this. So this can have all kinds of cascading effects when we're performing a meta-analysis. Not only does it mean that any of our actual um, uh, constituent estimates of effect size are quite bad in this low power setting, but it also means we're going to be introducing, we're gonna have all this noise, um, all of this extra variability um, in these particular constituent studies when we're actually trying to synthesize them in a meta-analysis. So this can make it really, really hard, um, basically, in the context of having a bunch of low power studies, it kind of it kind of poses the question of, well, would it even be worth it in that context to perform any type of meta-analysis anyway, uh, at least without trying to adjust or account for these types of errors in some way. Um, so just to show you what this, these type M errors might look like in some of these other situations, here when my power is a bit bigger, 25%, you can play that same type of game and see, well, where is the true effect? The true effect is maybe centered to about five, but my statistically significant effects, well, they're all eight or 10, 11, 12, they're all up here. So when our power is 25%, the, the magnitude error that we're making isn't quite as big as before, but it's still quite big. Our, our, if we have statistically significant effects, um, they're guaranteed to probably be two or three times too big. 8% um, I showed you, this is not a problem when we have a nicely high powered study, right? So here, going back to this picture where we had very, very high power for one of our constituent studies, say about 98%, got really nice separation between the null counterfactual distribution and the actual true distribution of the test statistic. And now you can think, well, all right, all of my um, statistically significant estimates, they're all gonna fall somewhere in this Lyme region and on average, that's gonna be really good because on average, well, they're gonna be right centered on the truth, right? The true um, differential effect between groups. Here it's corresponding to a effect size of about five. 
Um, and indeed, on average, if you look at the average um, estimate over this Lyme region, it's going to be right about five as well. So this is good. High power means our statistically significant estimates are going to be exactly right, at least on average. Um, so those would be very, very nice. This is the size. Lots and lots of confidence in um, uh, our ability to actually detect these non-zero treatment effects and similar types of um, pictures for these other high power settings, high power versus low power settings. Um, so, so these these magnet, these type M errors in particular are something that we, we really need to keep in mind when we're trying to uh, synthesize results from various studies. Um, now, I've, I've focused so far mainly on, on sample size and um, the true unobserved effect size in the population um, in talking about power, but, um, but it is important to point out that statistical power, it's a function of many other things as well. So certainly it is a function of population variability, so the actual variation of the phenomenon you are studying in the population. Um, but it is a function of other things as well, and these, these tend to be glazed over a bit, I think, sometimes to our detriment, and I'll come back to this one. So um, the overall distribution of your random phenomenon of interest, so any of you who've done uh, kind of a power analysis and maybe the, the planning stage of a study, um, uh, typically we kind of simplify things for ourselves by assuming that our test statistics are normally distributed or kind of close enough to normally distributed that we don't really have to worry about uh, kind of the shape of those sampling distributions. Um, it, uh, it turns out, though, that this, this, this assumption of kind of a well-behaved test statistic, um, this can really come back to hurt us uh, in the context of meta-analysis, um, in, particularly, in particularly when you're um, in the context of kind of mixed effect modeling, you're trying to actually control for um, uh, between study heterogeneity. Um, these other things I won't really talk much about. They're just on here just to remind you that, yes, your type 1 error rate does affect your power. The types of statistical tests you use, um, the types of estimation procedures you use, they affect your power. And of course, measurement error as well. I won't say much about those beyond this, but they're just on there to kind of remind you of this. All right, so let's, um, let's, uh, let's start writing down some of these actual kind of classic meta-analysis models. Here's just the, the standard uh, fixed spec uh, meta-analyst model, and uh, hopefully this notation is, is kind of familiar to most people. Um, if not, I've, I've um, defined what, uh, what each of these parameters mean, so our, our estimated effect size of interest from our particular study K. Um, fixed effect model, of course, assumes that there is one common true effect to all these studies. Um, and then there's some error, some sample uncertainty due to our particular study K. And this is, of course, uh, in, in general, going to have to be estimated. We're going to have to plug in an estimate here, uh, which would come from something like our, our standard error of our estimated effect in that study K. So it's actually a very, very easy calculation. And I'm not going to go through the math, but you can look it up in virtually any uh, meta-analysis textbook. Um, it's a very easy calculation to show that in this very, very simple setting, so under a fixed effects meta-analytic model, um, the power of this meta-analysis is going to be greater than the powers of all the constituent studies that you plug in here. Um, and the, the heuristic reason for this is basically that this very simple type of meta-analytic model, it's, it's essentially no different than a t-test, really. Um, it, it, it's kind of mathematically. Um, it does essentially the exact same thing as a t-test. So in this very, very simple type of meta-analytic setting, adding more studies kind of directly translates to this idea of uh, increasing your sample size, kind of keeping everything else the same, essentially, and being able to increase your sample size. And then that goes back to our uh, kind of initial intuition that we increase our sample size, that leads to greater power. So in a very, very simple type of setting, yes, we do have kind of this, this common wisdom does hold that um, synthesizing evidence from a bunch of different studies is going to give us better power. And so remember, that's a good thing in the context of something like, like one of these pictures. Um, if we have higher power, we're going to have a much uh, better ability to create, uh, to find estimates of our treatment effects that are actually accurate. They're actually reflecting 
the truth. They're actually reflecting reality. Um, so that's great. If you happen to be in a situation where a fixed effects model is appropriate, then great. Power is not such a huge concern for you. Um, and you can kind of use this if you wanted to actually perform a power analysis, any type of power calculations. Um, it, it's fairly straightforward since this does mirror kind of a t-test situation so much. And many textbooks kind of focus on this case. Um, and uh, there's lots that you can look up on. Certainly in Borenstein's textbook, he talks about this a lot. Um, so lots of good resources for this type of setting. If we start to complicate things a bit and look at kind of the standard, the most basic um, random effects meta-analytic model, um, now I've since at least changed my notation here a bit because I'm not assuming that each of my constituent studies are estimating the same true effect, um, but they're all estimating a variety of true effects coming from some common distribution of true effects. And so now this kind of grand meta-analytic average, <coughs> excuse me, now denoting it with an RE just to denote, just to emphasize that this is a random effect uh, parameter. Um, since we're not, since these studies are not all estimating a single true effect, um, it now makes sense to kind of specify a model to then try to estimate a, a mean or grand mean of the true effects. Um, we still have these little epsilon k's, which are going to capture the kind of sample uncertainty in each of, each of our particular studies. But now, of course, we also have this extra term, which I'm denoting u sub k here. And this is really the one that tends to occupy most of our time um, actually performing meta-analyses, realistic meta-analyses, because this is the term that is capturing the between-study heterogeneity. So the, the differences in these true effect sizes random differences in true effect sizes um, over all of our various constituent um, studies. And typically, we make this assumption that this, this kind of random effect is normally distributed. We technically, don't have to make that assumption, but it does greatly simplify things. Um, and uh, maybe unsurprisingly, in terms of this between study heterogeneity, this really can have a huge effect on power. Um, if you have Intuitively, I think this does kind of make sense too. I mean, if you're if you're trying to synthesize um, a bunch of related phenomena um, that nevertheless exhibit a lot of differences across those studies, a lot of heterogeneity, um, then it kind of I think intuitively makes sense that this is going to make it more challenging to be able to detect consistent treatment effects. Higher heterogeneity, less power, harder to detect um, non-zero effects. So um, there's some very nice pictures that I've kind of pulled out of uh, various resources. I've got the, uh, the um, uh, citations down here if you want to take a look. Um, some so various instances that I think do a nice job of kind of illustrating the uh, effects of this type of heterogeneity on statistical power. So remember, since statistical power is a function of so many different things, I had that slide listing at least like six or seven different things that directly affect statistical power. Um, it's very hard to kind of summarize the effects of larger or smaller between study heterogeneity um, in a single picture because those power still does depend on so many different things. But um, in this picture, this does kind of a nice job, I think, to start out looking at these things. So here, these, this, we've got these three little empirical curves, and these are denoting different statistical powers corresponding to different numbers of studies that we're synthesizing. So relatively few studies, 10, all the way up to uh, quite, quite, quite a few studies, up to 65. Um, and this is making these simplifying assumptions that our kind of population effect size is uh, the Cohen D. 0.15, so this is kind of a small effect size. Um, and the sample sizes of our constituent studies, they're all about 40. So not super small, uh, not super small, not super small constituent studies, and not super large either. And you can see these three different curves. So kind of this, where is it? Let me see, it's a diamond. So this top curve, this corresponds to assuming a fixed effects model, the triangles, random effects, and the squares are random effects, but the triangles correspond to a relatively small degree of between-study heterogeneity. 
whereas the squares have a pretty uh, a pretty large amount of between 70 and 180. And if you look at how this can affect, so this amount of heterogeneity, you can really start to see how much of an effect this can have on your statistical power. So if you compare the fixed effects framework to the random effects framework, where you only have a little bit, a small amount of between study heterogeneity, you notice that these top two curves, they're, they're pretty close. I mean, unsurprisingly, when we have some between study heterogeneity, we do have lower power than the fixed effects setting. So here, for example, synthesizing 40 studies, if they're all estimating the true, same true effect, power is about 90%. If instead we have a small amount of between study uh, variance, uh, variation, then our power dips to almost 80%. But still pretty good. However, when we move to a situation, and I would argue that this is usually the situation we find ourselves in, we have quite a bit of heterogeneity um, between our constituent studies, you can see that this can drastically hurt our power. So even in this situation, say, where we're synthesizing 40 studies, each of those studies has a reasonable sample size, sample size of about 40 also. Um, our power to detect this effect is a relatively small effect, cones B of about 0.15. It's only about, what, 44, 45%, something like that. That's still not super great. That still means we've got um, those type M errors we're going to be making, those, those overestimates in our effect sizes. Um, those are still certainly going to be coming through in our synthesized effects, or could be coming through in our synthesized effects. So um, uh, in this more realistic setting, random effect setting, where we have a decent amount of heterogeneity, um, it can actually take uh, quite a lot, quite a lot of studies, quite a lot of sample size in your constituent studies um, to actually achieve uh, what we would maybe consider good power, like power above 80%, something like that. Um, here's another diagram, actually, which is adapted, so <clears throat> Quintana wrote a nice little um, blog on this using some of this information from uh, the uh, the work of Valentine Pickett and Ross Stein. Um, this illustrates a bunch of different scenarios where we now have uh, low heterogeneity between our uh, target effects, moderate and large heterogeneity, and then the different rows corresponding to kind of small effect sizes, medium effect sizes, and large effect sizes. Um, and also how many studies are we actually going to synthesize. And I mean, if you kind of focus on this bottom row here, this is kind of a, this would be a great situation where we're, we're studying or synthesizing studies that are targeting very large effect sizes. And probably unsurprisingly, if we're studying large effect sizes, that means it's going to be relatively easy to detect those effects, to find those effects. And that's going to correspond in general to pretty high power. You can see that when we have low heterogeneity, we have super high power. But even when we have pretty large heterogeneity between our studies, if we are studying something with large effects, we can still achieve really high power pretty quickly. So let's say if you look at this, this green um, uh, line here, we're only synthesizing 10 studies here. Um, and even synthesizing 10 studies, when we each study has a sample size of about 20, see our power is already over 95%, which is really, really good. Um, so the bottom row isn't super interesting to us. Usually we're kind of finding ourselves in that top right-hand corner. So we're studying, uh, we're studying things that are trying to synthesize studies that are studying moderate or small effects in the population. And they might be doing this uh, in various ways that produce moderate or large heterogeneity between the studies. And here you can see that it's much, much harder to achieve reasonable power. If you look in kind of this worst case scenario where we have a lot of between study variation and we're targeting kind of small effect sizes, um, then remember these, these uh, different um, colors correspond to synthesizing 5, 10, 15, or 20 studies that we're combining. And you can see even when we're combining 20 studies and each of those studies has a sample size of about 50, our power is still only at about 60%, which is not terrible per se, um, but certainly not what we would hope for, what we might expect um, in a more idealized setting, a more idealized scenario. Um, okay, so so this, this, this between study variation, this between study heterogeneity, 
um, this is really what um, tends to hurt our power in kind of a realistic um, meta-analytic context. And so we naturally might want to find ways to reduce this between study heterogeneity. And of course, there's, there's lots of different things that have been proposed to do this, but I kind of always lump uh, your options into basically one of these two categories. So you can either kind of, well, change your research question, <laughs> change your target of inference, change the, the um, target effect that you're trying to synthesize, and that could reduce heterogeneity because of course you're kind of changing the game, you're changing the goalposts. Um, could do that, um, it's not always a feasible option. So instead, we might do things like, well, let's try to find ways to explain that between study variation, to account for it somehow. And this could lead to performing some type of matter regression. Um, but this is also, broadly speaking, um, kind of the motivation behind performing more complicated things like a network meta-analysis, trying to leverage information from um, uh, from studies uh, targeting related effects, trying to leverage information from these other situations to try to maybe explain away some of this uh, between study heterogeneity, um, hopefully simultaneously, actually. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, so meta-regression network meta-analysis, really I kind of view them as um, attempts to minimize this between study heterogeneity um, in the context of power in the, it, it, with the goal of trying to increase our statistical power. Um, so here's kind of just a very generic um, meta-regression type model. So this is kind of a generic mixed effects model. Notice it looks very similar to the random effect meta-analytic model, but now I've got these, uh, this combination of predictors. So these are maybe <clears throat> uh, predictors that correspond to maybe the quality of your individual studies, so studies with maybe a lot of bias or very poor controls, um, we might flag those in a certain way with the predictor versus ones that have um, uh, very high quality, very nice controls, um, all kinds of predictors you can imagine. Um, including in here, that might explain some of this between study variation, heterogeneity. Um, a network meta-analysis model is, of course, going to look like kind of a, 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 um, a system of various mixed effects models, so I won't bother writing out a separate equation for that, but it's basically kind of falling in the same um, uh, general statistical framework here. And um, there's two things to notice here. One thing is, well, when we're in the context of kind of regression, we're trying to explain between study heterogeneity by incorporating some other information, um, one downside is, well, we're going to have to use a power to actually estimate those beta j's, so actually estimate the um, effects of these predictors or the associations of these predictors um, on our response. So we will have to use up some power um, that way. And we, of course, still have, we still have between study heterogeneity. We're still going to have some estimate of this tau squared. Hopefully it's going to be smaller, um, hopefully accounting for some of this, uh, some of these differences between the studies with our fixed effects. Hopefully that's going to have the effect of reducing the unexplained between study heterogeneity. But of course it is still going to be there. There is still going to be some between study heterogeneity. Now it's just going to be conditional on the values of our predictors. Um, and again, normally we assume that these things are normally distributed. Um, are these true effect sizes conditional on the values of the predictors? We assume some type of normal structure. And if this fails, we know that this can deflate power. And deflate power, of course, and that means it can distort our estimates through this type of error, say. It can distort our prediction intervals, all these and negative cascading effects throughout the analysis. Um, and I just want to illustrate here how this non-normality can kind of come back and hurt our power again in this type of situation. So again, you can kind of just to fix ideas, think of kind of a standard t-test. Um, and in that type of setting, large sample sizes are great. We don't have to worry about the distribution of our data. But if we have very small sample sizes, then the t-test says that our data should be approximately normal. <clears throat> if we have non-normal data, um, this, this can end up hurting our power. So this is a graphic that I've 
used many times actually. My good friend and, and co-author, Oscar Olera Stevia, has a very nice and accessible blog post um, on this. And he created a very nice graphic that kind of shows just in this very typical type of t-test setting um, where we might have, okay, ideally normal, normally distributed data. That's this blue curve right here. We can achieve 80% power, kind of a medium effect size, 80% um, power to the text difference with a sample size of only about 26 or 27. But you make your data a little bit non-normal. And, and if you're curious, you can go to his blog post, he, can, he defines that exactly. But this is basically adding a little bit of skewness um, to the data. Uh, you can see that to achieve 80% power, we basically need to double our sample size. I have to get up to about 50. So when you have relatively small samples, non-normality um, can uh, really kind of, um, the, the effect of non-normality can really kind of have a large effect on your statistical power. Um, and this becomes quite important to us in the context of the meta-analysis because typically we're, well, you might be lucky enough to be synthesizing hundreds of studies, but typically you're probably only going to be synthesizing, at least what I've usually seen is maybe a dozen or dozens of studies. So this can make it quite, uh, uh, quite important what the actual distribution of those estimated effect sizes are, what the distribution of those true effects, um, that those estimated effect sizes are actually estimated. Um, so unfortunately, it's kind of hard to, um, to just go to one particular set of software um, that's going to try to kind of incorporate all of these different possibilities, all of these things that could affect your power simultaneously. Um, I know people are always working on new functions and new software to do this, um, but certainly at least kind of the, the standard ones, the ones that everybody are aware of, uh, many of them are, are designed for quite simple scenarios. Um, in particular, maybe scenarios where you always have, let me go back here, sorry, where you always have, this is always a very reasonable assumption that the distribution of your true effects are actually normal once you condition on the values of your predictors. Um, assuming that that's the case, then you might be able to perform kind of a decent, <clears throat> a decent power analysis uh, using some kind of standard software in R, R has various packages to do this. Um, but in general, what I always recommend, really in kind of any type of situation, is if you really care about power, you're probably going to want to design some a fairly detailed simulation study to really allow for yourself to manipulate all of these different things that could affect um, the power of your meta-analysis um, when you're synthesizing these results. Um, and this, this study by Valentin Bigot and Rothstein, they actually um, Talk, they give quite a few nice details. They run various simulation uh, studies to uh, study the effects of power in various uh, uh, mixed effects models. So if you take a look at this paper, it's kind of a nice place to start um, to see kind of how a simulation would work. Uh, it's definitely something that I recommend if you really want to kind of study this yourself in earnest. Um, the, just to kind of wrap up here, there are about five minutes here. I just wanted to go back and re-emphasize this, this, this effect of type M error. So this is something I, I always kind of go back to, I always try to remind people of, because I find it's, um, it, it's often overlooked. Um, remember, so this, this, this magnitude error, this type M error, this was something that we saw happened when we were in a low power setting. So in the context of meta-analysis, maybe you're synthesizing relatively few studies and the target effects are relatively small. Um, so small effect sizes, perhaps high heterogeneity, large heterogeneity between these studies. Um, we're going to have to start worrying about this type M error and the effects that it could have on our synthesized results. And so something that I've kind of recommended to people in the past is uh, try to explicitly downweight your study with low power. Now, kind of the traditional inverse variance weighting, it's in traditional inverse variance weighting does do this to an extent. So inverse variance weighting is, uh, is a function of sample size and sampling variance. And we know that both of those quantities uh, factor into a study's power. But power, remember, does depend on many other things as well. So if you're really in this type of setting where you're really worried about low power, synthesizing low power studies, 
um, and what kind of effect this can have on your results, then you might want to consider doing something a bit more. So creating other weights that maybe encode this type M error information a bit more explicitly. So something that maybe, so those, those numbers I said, those, those kind of in a 8% power situation are statistically significant results are exaggerated by about a factor of eight. That's typically called an exaggeration ratio. Um, you might want to try to actually build that into your weights. Um, I haven't seen anybody actually write a paper on this yet, but I've kind of encouraged people in the past to try to do this. Um, I don't really have the time myself to do it, but I think it'd be a very interesting uh, study to do. Um, various ways of trying to specify these weights um, to kind of adjust. Uh, adjust for this extra type M error when you're synthesizing um, low-powered studies, say. Or you happen to find yourself in a situation where you uh, are in a low-powered meta-analysis just because of high heterogeneity, perhaps, between the studies. So this is something that I think would be really useful to study. Uh, remember, this is a diagram of this type M error, how far away these statistically significant results are going to have to be from the true thing they're trying to estimate when your power is very small. Right? So some way to adjust for that type M error. And uh, consider uh, creating these, uh, these weights, uh, re sorry, re-weighting um, how you synthesize these things to try to uh, adjust for this type M error. This is going to factor in all kinds of things. And as I said, go check out the paper by Gelman and Carlin, because they do a much better, much more thorough job of talking about um, the relationship between this type M error and things like prior believability of hypothesis, how to use previous literature and knowledge um, to, uh, to try to quantify this type M error. Um, so lots of different ideas, things that you could pursue um, to try to um, uh, make this adjustment for a low-powered situation. Um, good. So just to summarize here, um, this, this kind of uh, common knowledge or common, common wisdom, you might say, of uh, meta-analyses are good because they increase our power. And that, that really is only true in uh, very, very simple scenarios. Um, certainly not true when we are trying to synthesize uh, things where there's quite a bit of between-study heterogeneity, um, which I think tends to be the case we find ourselves in. So. So don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that, well, just because I'm synthesizing a bunch of studies, I don't necessarily need to worry that much about power. No, in fact, power can become a, a, a very big concern in these types of situations. 